Distinguished guests, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to have you here with us for the IGC 2012 in Cologne. Especially I want to welcome Her Royal Highness Princess Maha Chakri Shirodon, Princess um, of the Kingdom of Thailand. Um, um, and it's very good, great to have you here for our conference, um, to have you here in this room for our keynote lectures. And of course, I want to warmly welcome our two speakers of today. That's Professor Anne Buttemer and Professor Klaus Töpfer. Today we start our series of key lectures uh, on our four key topics for, of our Congress. Every day our conference will have one prominent personality and one distinguished geographer which, um, who, who will talk to us about important issues related to the key topics of our conference. Today we start with the first key topic, that's society um, and environment. It's my pleasure to introduce today's first keynote speaker, Professor Klaus Töpfer. But it will be a hard task. Klaus Töpfer held so many important um, and international and national positions during his career that it's simply impossible to mention them all in just one or two minutes. But I will try to do my best. To begin with, Klaus Töpfer is founding director of the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies, IASS, in Potsdam. He's senator of the Helmholtz Gemeinschaft, Helmholtz Association, which is Germany's largest network of scientific research centers. And he's former executive, executive director of the United Nations Environmental Program, headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. Moreover, he is vice president of the Welthungerhilfe, a large NGO fighting against hunger in the world. And he was, until recently, co-director of the Essex Commission on Safe Energy Supply of the German government. In some ways, however, Klaus Töpfer is also one of us, an academic and university professor. He studied economics in Mainz and in Frankfurt and worked as a researcher in spatial planning at the University of Münster in the 1960s and 1970s. In Münster, he received his doctoral degree for a thesis on regional policies and location decisions, a topic which is very close, especially to economic geographers. From 1978, he was then professor and director of the Institute of Spatial Research and Regional Planning at the University of Hanover. He was a member of the advisory board of the Government on the Environment and a board member of the German Development Bank, KfW Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau. In 1985, he has been appointed to honorary professor in Mainz in 1985 and in Tübingen in 2005. And since 2007, he also teaches sustainable development at the University of Shanghai in China. Apart from this academic career, however, Töpfer was still and is one of the most prominent figures in German politics. No doubt about that. His political career started in the 1970s already. Between 1987 and 1998, he served as minister in the federal government under Chancellor Helmut Kohl. First as a minister for the environment between 87 and 94, and then as minister for spatial and urban planning between 1994 and 1998. He was also a member during this time, or parallel to it, a member of the federal parliament of the Federal Republic of Germany, the Bundestag from 1990 to 1998. Our speaker, Klaus Töpfer, received many distinctive awards and honors, too many to mention them all. So I want to name just a few. Prominent examples for its many awards and honors are the Federal Cross of Merits, Bundesverdienstkreuz, um, he received in 1990, and the German Sustainability Prize for his lifetime achievement in 2008. In February this year, he became inducted to the Kyoto um, Earth Hall of Fame for his outstanding contribution to the conservation of the global environment. Professor Töpfer, I'm eagerly looking forward for your keynote lecture today, titled On the Way to the Anthropocene, Consequences of Scientific Research, Societal Understanding, and Political Responsibility. So please join me in welcoming Professor Klaus Töpfer to our conference.
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, Professor Braun, first lesson to learn, never invite an old man like myself. <laughs> he has too many titles, he has too long way to go, so next time shorten it. It's enough to listen on such an occasion to the speakers. And I have to confess, and I have to mention it, that I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm not a geographer. And there are some people even believing, is he really a scientist? He was a long, long time a politician. So there is the risk that you are judged as a hybrid person. And you know, all those hybrids have a difficult topic to overcome. You know this little story from the football player who was also singing popular songs. <laughs> so the singer say he might be a good football player and the football player say they, he might be a good singer. So nevertheless, in our time, I believe we need more and more those hybrids because we are in an open democratic system and there it is very important to integrate wherever possible. And therefore, I was courageous enough to accept this invitation and I'm really honored. It's a pleasure to be here at this most important Congress. I wish to congratulate the organizers here and abroad for doing this brilliant job and to bring this Congress after more than 100 years back to Germany, and not only to Germany, but to Cologne, and to this excellent university. Congratulations, and thank you for the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, only some four years ago, in October 2007, the first interdisciplinary symposium of Nobel Prize laureates took place in Potsdam, a city next to Berlin. The title, Global Sustainability, a Nobel Course. More than 15 Nobel Prize laureates of the different scientific disciplines participated. It was an intensive, a deep-rooted discussion, also with leading politicians like the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, I dare to name her a leading politician, as well as with representatives of civil society and business. At the end of this symposium, the considerations and conclusions were integrated in the so-called Potsdam Memorandum. These main conclusions underline in the very beginning, and I quote, the worldwide socioeconomic acceleration has pushed our planet into an unprecedented situation. Humanity is acting now as a quasi-geological force on a planetary scale that will qual qualitatively and irreversibly alter the national Earth system mode of operations should business as usual be pursued." End of quote. I was First and foremost, a little bit skeptic, because looking back in history, you will have find a generation not being absolutely convinced that this is an absolute single and extraordinary situation for their generation. So those sentences like, in an unprecedented situation, makes me a little bit nervous. But nevertheless, in those days, in 2007, I just finished my eight years as the executive director of the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP. Maybe the one or the other knows that this is headquartered not in New York and not in Geneva, but in Nairobi, in Kenya, in the middle of this great continent. By the way, I learned with pleasure that also my good old colleague Anna Tibayuka will come in to deliver a speech here. Congratulations, a very good decision. She is res we was responsible for the Habitat, UN Habitat, also headquartered in Nairobi. 
And in this situation, for more than eight years, I had to fly again and again, mainly from Amsterdam to Nairobi and vice versa. What draw immediately my attention looking through the window of the plane was a simple fact. Flying over the so-called developed European countries from Amsterdam to the northern coastline of the Mediterranean, I noticed with surprise those exceptional areas or small places not used by mankind. On the other side of the Mediterranean, looking down, those exceptional areas used, my, used by mankind raised my attention. It was exactly the opposite. Participating actively in the Potsdam discussion, formulating and reading these findings of a quasi-geological force, those different pictures between Europe and Africa came back to my mind. Development in the Western world resulted in reshaping of nature in landscape designing and changing wetlands into agricultural usable places, changing soil fertilities with fertilizers, damming rivers for electricity production, and lots of other uses. Rivers changed in their course. The example of the River Rhine just in the city. The River Rhine was shortened by the visionary plans of an ingenious engineer named Tulla, a professor at the University of Karlsruhe in those days. In 1817, it was shortened for more than 60 kilometers, changing, of course, the flood condition after heavy rainfall quite drastically. Development resulted in a man-made so-called natural disaster. The probability of floods and the intensity of these floods increased quite drastically. Nature disaster or man-made disaster? These are mainly regional, in some cases even local examples for the designing of nature by mankind, an old experience in this field. These changes are in principle reversible. The direct and indirect impacts are limited on the regional scale, not inflicting the living condition of people living far away. This kind of a man-made nature can re be reshaped again, echoing new human needs, better scientific insights, or cor correcting negative consequences of previous intervention. Mentioning again the River Rhine as an example, I also was, and you forgot it to mention, a minister in one of our regional states, in Rheinlandi Palatinat, a state directly on the River Rhine. We benefited from the correction of the Rhine. Lots of additional agricultural places available, but our downstreamers came back and said, you have to change it again. So it was decided to construct what we call the polders. So to make a man-made polder system to open those polder doors if the flood is, when the flood is coming and to stop the flooding downstream. You may imagine a hell of a job. Because all those places were in the meantime, of course, intensively used by mankind for agriculture, for recreation purposes, for villages, cities, roads. I can inform you until today, and I'm quite a long time already out of this responsibility, lucky I am, not a single of this polder is operational. In principle, we can make the reversible processes possible, but in the reality is much more difficult, nevertheless, it is another dimension. The fascinating progress of science, this acceleration process of research, is more and more, as we know, revealing the construction pattern of nature, of creation, of life. All these findings are characterized by the same denominator. Their consequences are far-reaching in time and in geographical scale. 
the sociologist Elias named it the prolongation of the action chain. These results of science and research enable mankind to change willingly or unwillingly, by chance or by purpose, the condition for the stability of nature, of the large ecosystems, from the oceans via the cryosphere, the biosphere and the atmosphere. These changes are increasingly characterized to be irreversible and to be global in scale. The negative of human actions based on scientific findings in our time, in the time of synthetic biology, of artificial intelligence, of the decoding of the genome and the proteome of life, of man, are far-reaching and irreversible. This quasi-geological force of mankind reaches much further than the one described before as a consequence like linked with the ability to design the physical earth for the sake of economic development in a world with more and more human beings. When I was born, long time ago, the world has to cope with 2.7 billion people, 2.7 billion. Now we have, as you know, more than 7 billion. And my youngest grandchild, this is the most important achievement in my life, by the way, will be 38 years old in the year 2050. And then she has to live together on this planet with something about 9 billion people. So you see that this is the other dimension as what I mentioned in the very beginning, as important the other things are as well. Not only a design landscape is now the reality, there is a vision, the expectation, to some extent already the reality that man is possible to have a design weather, a design rainfall. You can influence this. Rain may be no longer a natural event only. Rainfall will be of more often a man-made event bringing the access to water in the world with more than nine billion people in a new dimension of conflicts. I cannot go in more detail, but believe me, being responsible for the environment program in the United Nations system, you see a lot of possible conflicts linked with such a perspective. The case of climate change is in this context especially relevant Mitigation of greenhouse gases is and will stay the best option for any serious global change approach in politics economics. Where it is not possible to do it enough or not early enough, we know that adaptation is absolutely a must. It is the first step of engineering, no doubt. And we, I come back to this, will see that there is a further perspective for engineering in this field too. The engineering and handling the negative consequences, the unwanted side effects of previous human activity is specifically important in this case of climate change. What, do, what to do when all the activities to mitigate or to adapt to climate change are not sufficient, not successful? How to handle what the IPCC mentioned in its last report if we are confronted with a climate emergency situation. Scientific research is necessary to single out the possibilities for this kind of engineering, climate engineering, geoengineering, to identify the negative consequences, the different regional implications, the reversibility, to name only those few questions for intensive scientific research. In May this year, the newspaper The New Yorker published an article with a headline, The Climate Fixers. 
Regarding the ethical aspect of those interventions, I will come back later. But we know, of course, that there are lots of those questions without any doubt. This new dimension of human influence on shaping nature and life, on shaping the capacity and the structure of the Earth, revitalizes a fairly old question. The question whether the Holocene the actual Earth period lasting already for more than 10,000 years is coming to an end or came already to an end. There is the question or the expectation that the new era is a man-made world. The quasi-geological forces are developing to what is called the Anthropocene. As the latest article of the Nobel Prize laureate Paul Crutzen in Nature 2002, titled Geology of Mankind, started a quite controversial discussion on this topic on the Anthropocene. It was the International Stratigraphic Commission responsible since all the time in the past for declaring different periods on Earth that accepted this consideration as a serious topic of further discussion. Paul Crutzen, a good old friend, an uh, atmospheric chemist, and for a long time the head of the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry in Mainz, Germany, was honored in 1995 with the Nobel Prize for Chemistry together with Mario Molina and Rowland. Those three scientists were honored due to their research on the ozone depletion for scientifically tracing the reasons for the ozone hole in the CFCs. In the mentioned article in Nature, Paul Kruzen underlined, and I quote, with regard to the ozone topic, the things could have become much worse. The ozone-destroying properties of the halogens have been studied since a long time, but more by luck than by wisdom, this catastrophic situation that the ozone hole would be a global year-round phenomenon did not develop. This remark gives a clear signal for the necessary perspective of science and research in a time where, and I quote Kruzen once more, Mankind will remain a major environmental force for many millennia. A daunting task lies ahead for scientists and engineers to guide society towards environmentally sustainable management during the era of Anthropocene. The engineering is a countermeasure to handle the negative consequences of human action based on scientific findings. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I don't believe that only scientists and engineers are responsible for handling these challenges of the Anthropocene. Of course, they have to do their utmost to study the direct and indirect consequences of the knowledge coming from the detection of the construction of pattern of life. But we are living in a time of intensive global economic competition. We are living in a time with an ongoing dramatic increase of human population, as I mentioned before. All those people, all those nine billion and more, are determined to detect new chances and options to overcome poverty, to make economic development with jobs possible. What are the consequences of this dilemma? In the Potsdam Memorandum, the question is raised, is there a third way between environmental destabilization and persisting underdevelopment, especially with regard to the situation in the energy markets? The answer is yes, and they add through reinventing of our industrial metabolism through a great transformation, a great transformation mentioned years and decades before by Polanyi in his famous book. 
What does it mean for the real world we are living in? This world, to cut it short, lives under the dictate of short-termism. It is really a tyranny of short-termism. All the crises we are confronted with quite now, the climate crisis, the crisis of ecosystems and biological diversity, the crisis of food production, and last but not least, the crisis of the economic and financial architecture uh, in the world, all those crises and many more are nothing else than the oath of disclosure of this short term. In Germany, friends and colleagues, the so called bad word of the year is announced annually. In 2010, this bird was without alternative. In Maggie Thatcher's time, there was the mentioning of the so-called Tina principle. Tina means there is no alternative. As an economist by education, I have to confess, I learned that on the short term, all costs are fixed costs and that on the medium and long term, all costs are flexible costs. So we come back to the question of time. Without alternatives, everything is fixed. Too big to fail. This is an indicator for the short-termism in the world. Wherever society accepts the TINA principle, the consequences will be a growing crisis, especially of a parliamentarian democracy. In a time of short-termism and the reign of the TINA principle, there is no room for parliamentarian discussion concerning alternatives, because it is, by definition, not an alternative available. The Anthropocene will challenge scientists of all fields, will challenge civil society and politicians to prolong again the time scale to overcome short-termism and to develop alternatives. That is the indicator for sustainability in my eyes. This principle, more than 300 years old in the next year, starting from Karl von Karlowitz, this mining official in Saxonia. The dilemma is unsolved until now, if I see it correctly. The dictate of short-termism in policy and society on the one side and the need for the prolongation of the action chain combined with the growing influence of mankind in the Anthropocene in a time where mankind is a quasi-geological force. It was the German-Jewish philosopher Hans Jonas in his landmark book, The Principle of Responsibility, who singled out a new categorical imperative for our times of technology, and I quote, his categorical imperative, act in a way that the consequences of your actions are comparable with the permanence of genuine human life on Earth, exactly the long-term perspectives. Responsibility, this is an ethical question for the long-term consequences. That is a great transformation we need. That is sustainability in my interpretation. Going back to the concrete example of climate change, knowing that human actions result in massively releasing greenhouse gases and changing the climate, how to decide on the research and the implementation of climate engineering, correcting the mistakes of human action by interventions of engineers and scientists in the absorption capacity of oceans by injecting particles, for example, sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, who will be responsible for the decisions to come to such a forced adaptation? What are the ethical consequences of this? Is that changing that mankind is not only a part of the creation, but he wants to be a creator? 
In IPCC, as I mentioned before in the last report, it was mentioned this climate emergency topic. Who is developing an emergency response policy having in mind that the consequences of those interventions may be worse than the emergency itself? Will the water to fight the fire of the crisis be more destructive than the fire itself? A question I have to ask, for example, quite now in the way we are handling the financial crisis in Europe and worldwide. After eight years as an Under Secretary General of the United Nations, I come to the conclusion that we don't have a global governance structure for those situations at all. Nevertheless, we have already a draft law on climate engineering in the US Congress. We know that something comparable is going on also in the British Parliament, but we don't have a governance structure as far as I see it. It is an urgent need for the political class to develop new governance structures for the era of the Anthropocene. The Nobel Prize laureates in Potsdam asked for a global contract, a great transformation as mentioned, between science and society, a contract that would embrace many elements. Is that a real option? How to integrate such a process in an open democracy system? Therefore, I come back to ask more and more intensively that we have not only to ask for interdisciplinary science, but for a transdisciplinary science to integrate the private, the civil society, in the development of science as well, and not only to participating them in the implementation of the findings of science. Quite a huge challenge. We try to do a little bit in this direction in this mentioned institute. By the way, we also have a young scientist as a director who is now the coordination point in Europe for climate engineering. We don't want to make it, but we have to learn what are the consequences, what is the reversibility, what is the regional, what is the global consequences, having in mind that this is going on in the broader field of science around the world. Let me underline it. it is absolutely necessary in my understanding that more and more people around the world are aware of these dimensions of a world heavily influenced by decisions of mankind with long-lasting irreversible consequences. It is necessary that more and more people draw consequences, that they themselves accept responsibility. I had the chance to be at Rio Plus 20 a couple of weeks ago. We come in a situation and there's a critical discussion going on that we are aware of the unwillingness or not ability of government, governments to handle and that private, that civil society have to take on the job. Other people are criticizing that we are privatizing climate policy. And I think we have to be aware of the need also as a society still. Responsibility. Ulrich Beck the well-known German sociologist underlined, if society is made responsible, nobody is responsible. This is nothing else than a collective unresponsibility. I think a very important quote in my understanding. If you make an abstract body responsible, nobody is responsible. So please, don't go in this direction wherever this is possible. The discussion whether we are living already in a new man-made world in the Anthropocene, whether all those influences of mankind on nature are as old as mankind itself, the deforestation of the Apennine, and you can mention a lot, and you do it better than I can do it. This discussion will go on, and I believe this has to go on. In our country, in Germany, we will have together with the Max Planck Society, a two years program, also with exhibitions and participation of people, exactly in doing something like this. And I sincerely believe 
that this is necessary, it must be controversial, otherwise we would be again in the same trap that we accept too early the, uh, there is no alternative. But the simple fact that quantitatively and qualitatively mankind is more than ever influencing nature is unquestioned. The differentiation between nature, natural and man-made catastrophes is more and more fluid. The chair of mankind in all kinds of catastrophes, catastrophes is growing, especially having in mind the consequences of these nature catastrophes. A tsunami is, of course, as far as we know it now, not man-made. But the consequences are dramatically different with the man-made structure of human habitats, industrialized sites, nuclear power plants on the coastlines. It is an immense challenge and a change for the geographic scientific community, as I see it, not only to describe the consequences of this quasi-geological force, more than ever, it seems most demanding to take over responsibility for transparency of developments, for singling out consequences in the medium and long term, in integrating civil society in research topics, and to learn the other way around that knowledge can also produce by the uh, civil society to be aware of the new categorical imperative of Hans Jonas. I'm absolutely convinced that this conference here in Cologne will contribute manifold to this request. It is necessary to do it, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Töpfer, for your inspiring talk and for finding words for what I'm sure many geographers think and what we are actually working on every day and for the, your talks about the role of science, the role science can play in this transformation process, in this process of change.